Welcome to our Waldner Academy and thanks a lot that so many people are joining us. My name is Alexander Biller and I'm looking forward to share a lot of campus inspiration with you. Our topic today, universities and institutes, global campus trends for the future. And we have really fantastic speakers today. Impulse number one is Paul Roberts, director, Turnberry, UK. He will talk about what are the global campus trends for the future. The second impulse is from our mastermind, Dr. Samantha Hall, principal director, campus intuition, Australia. And she will answer the question, why is it time to change the way we think about the campus? The third impulse, is from David Keenan, National Director, Science and Research, CBRE Australia. And he will talk about how can we transform our campus. After this three impulses, we have a Q&A session. And if you have questions, write it in the chat and we will discuss and answer that after the session. So thanks a lot for joining us. I hope everybody has a good and warm cup of coffee in his hand. And then I would say, let's start. Paul, it's your turn. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, my name is Paul Roberts of uh, Turnberry, the UK. Um, I'm a sort of strategic development consultant for universities, principally having worked uh, for a long time for the University of Oxford and more latterly the University of Melbourne. Uh, and I've been the co-author of two books on university planning and architecture and two editions of a Routledge public book, Campus Trends. So I'm going to tell you, tell you a little bit about the past and then talk a little bit about the present and the future. So we know universities have been around for a long time and competition in relation to universities has always been around. So when we think about the oldest university in the, in the world, arguably, um, self-proclaimed to some extent, the University of Bologna, even in the 16th century, it was trying to undertake developments to defend itself against faculty leaving, going to Luca, going to Padua, going to other universities. So this idea of competition has been around for a very long time. But universities as we know them today have a sort of a genesis a very long time ago. The development of Merton College in 1264 was a seminal moment in the development of universities. Because at that point when there were three principal universities in this part of the world in Paris, Cambridge and Oxford. Oxford decided to build Mob Quad. It was housing, there was a hall, you were fed, there was a chapel, there was religious instruction, there was pastoral care, and there was also teaching. At the time, Paris only taught and judged that the city would resolve your other needs. And therefore, when American universities started, they started in that English trend, although they were very open, they weren't quadrangular. So when you look at US universities, they front the street in a way that quadrangular universities or Catholic institutions don't do that. And as they developed over time, American universities became a dominant model. If you think there are 20,000 or so universities in the world and 5,000 of them are in the United States, you start to understand the balance of the, of the differences. And three models emerged in a, a, a relatively rapid period of time. One was academical. This is um, University of Virginia, designed by uh, Jefferson and built by Jefferson, which was a curriculum building alignment. So the little areas that were the faculty buildings, where you lived, where you grew your vegetables, where you were served, where you went to the library, an academic building structure. Relatively uh, few of these survived that period or continue to be built now because the curriculum changes so fast and buildings don't change fast. The second approach that came forward, which is problematic today, this is the College of California, which is now UC Berkeley, was the Puritanical go away from the city, go away from all the vices and have a university education in a remote rural setting. Problematic today. And finally, the Columbian Expedition, the city beautiful, 
University of Chicago, how uh, beauty would override most of the issues that emerged. So for a period of time, the Open US University, the Quadrangular Oxbridge University, academical, beautiful and puritanical became the five models of universities that emerged over the long run. The difference of Central European universities, this is Lund, but I could have put up Graz, or I could have put up Bastion and Geneva or other places, um, is that there was no, what Kabuzia called a city in itself. There were no residences, there were no dormitories, there were no dining rooms because principally it was academic instruction only within the city. And that's a bifurcation that separates these places over the long run. Perhaps more concerning as universities developed was the post second world war issue uh, which came out of the California Master Plan. So this is Chicago's circle. And what was concerning about this is their whole cloth campuses. They're built by one individual, one designer at one time to one group of technologies with one academic vision, which means that as things change, someone like University of East Anglia with its one building, its one teaching wall, is now 50 years after it's finished, has an inflexible group of single purpose teaching buildings which are very hard to maintain. So the whole cloth campus caused this is in that regard. Much as it did when people decided that to be uh, very striking in terms of what was done, this is started at MIT, was also a way, th way through that problem. So we started to see the breaking down of trends from obvious models to a different type of consideration today. So what's that different type of consideration? Lots of countries in the world, or certain universities in the world, need scale to drive income, to drive research. But what we also know, if you look at the average rankings of universities on the left-hand side of the scale and the size of the institution on the right-hand side of the scale, is the bigger you are, the more lowly you're likely to be ranked. So it's very tough to be large and highly ranked. Toronto is the massive statistical outlier, which is nearly over 100,000 students and ranked in the top 20 in the world. So size becomes an issue over time, as does typology. People haven't known for a long run whether any particular type of campus made a different academic outcome until work a few years ago by Cal Poly and then the University of Nevada, which looked at around 100 universities in the US and tried to establish which typology, whether it's urban, suburban, rural, research, public, private, drove the best academic outcomes. And they found that the best universities had four characteristics. They were all the same. They were all urban. This is the University of Pennsylvania. It's urban. They were all green. You can probably see it's green. They were all historic and they all had high proportions of pastorally controlled student accommodation. So that's shown that the urban university with good living facilities, whether they be in Edinburgh or elsewhere, probably drives the best academic outcomes. And as a result, suburban universities, this is in Colorado, um, more difficult to drive, more expensive to operate, hard to create life, hard to create dormitories. You can't lay anything off the city. So over time, these type of institutions, the post-war institutions, have tried to densify to compete with urban universities. And in the United States, even more challenging, the rural university, this is Colgate, become very difficult to sustain because everything has to be paid for yourself and creating that student experience is very difficult. Therefore, what were very historical, difficult environments in the 1960s are now seen as preeminent environments. And interestingly, if we look at Oxford Cambridge comparison, the pink is the sort of historic core of Oxford. This is the science area to the top right hand corner, the Keeble Triangle and the Radcliffe Observatory Quarter. What Oxford had done in the last 20 years is crammed the centre of the city. It is possibly one of the most difficult places to build. There are more of the highest protected buildings in Oxford than any other city in the UK, yet the university has chosen to densify the centre of its city to allow teaching and research to establish. Whilst Cambridge have chosen to, over the long run, move to the west in the, in the, in the wars, to the West Cambridge Master Plan in the 1970s, to Eddington, and to the south around the hospitals and have taken a different approach. So much so that this is a University Cambridge document. The red squares are what you might call research universities with more than a proportion of their income for research. And you'll see that the University of Cambridge has the highest non-residential estate in the UK, but is far from being the largest university. So that suburban nature is driving essentially a less efficient outcome over time.
So when someone like Oxford builds their new physics building, which is five stories above ground and five stories below ground, that is a very expensive building to build in the center of the city. But they would judge academically and collaboratively the right place to build. Because over the long term, libraries that in the 1970s were becoming moribund because of the change in technology and Wi-Fi have now returned to their preeminent status as library structures over time. The dangers of curriculum alignment, as I mentioned with the University of Virginia, are problematic. This is the University of Queensland, where a lecture theatre was built to accommodate the total first year engineering cohort of the university. Now, in the current climate, is that a sustainable feature over the longer term? Where you build very aligned the curriculum, does that work as you move forward? But what you build is important. This is an undergraduate teaching cohort of 9,000 students and the blue line is their academic grade and the red line is the amount of time spent on campus. And what it shows is there's a clear um, correlation between how much time you spent on campus and how good your degree was. We don't know the answer to the question, do brighter stent students spend longer on campus or if you spend longer on campus, you'll do better. But what it means is the quality of the campus experience, which Sam will want to talk about, is paramount in this process. So the trends then you start to see through this process, particularly where there are higher student fees, not so where there is state funded education, is hub type schemes. So you can see this scheme, University of Exeter, move from what was a windswept plaza to a complex grid shell student hub, or a scheme like this, which is possibly one of the best schemes built anywhere for the student experience, which is a Duke University stitched in between historic buildings, quite a hugely impressive facility. The amount of activation that goes on, which Sam will cover in much more detail, becomes more paramount. And beauty, the return to beauty in a world of technological efficiency, the aspiration that, you know, man, man or woman has an insatiable hunger for beauty never moves away from the collegiate and scholastic experience. And therefore, how they are branded, how they are set up, why people say it's a unique learning experience remains today as important as it's always been. The idea of scholarship becomes more important over time as well. As you think about the changes and the accommodations people have, when Leland Stanford originally conceived of his university and he wanted to achieve a new president, he said that I thought three times the salary would bring my new president. But I realise that accommodations are more important to these people than money alone, whether anybody on this call takes the same view. And therefore, the adherence to what was a brochure, a concept by Stanford then, to what Stanford became is incredibly similar as they maintain this long term culture of brand and awareness. Surprisingly, within formal learning areas, the concept of scholarship or scholarliness gets more and more important. What is the Western Library of Book Depository in Oxford changes into a quasi public private space and creates an environment which is really a throwback to some extent or a look forward to the expectations of students as you move forward. Places like fixed libraries in Berlin being built to exceptional standards, incredibly highly occupied or Calatrava's Law Library in Zurich again, very, very highly attended. So this idea that the library is dead or the quality of the library is dead is not necessarily the case. As there becomes greater pressure globally for competition, the collections of universities, whether they be art or, or archaeological, become very important. America leads the way in this because the Carnegie um, Foundation, um, Mellon Foundation, way past anybody else. So these are the museums at Yale. The experience for a student learning with art at Dartmouth the digitization at Harvard of one million items. Harvard had item, items that were looked at once in a decade. They digitized, displayed, they worked at 13 times in a semester. This is the change of how these things work. The idea of separating scholarship into different places to allow people to have that differentiated experience in other areas. The Rhodes Trust, possibly something that would tend to degrade over time is as strong or stronger than it has ever been as it seeks to move from a scholarship house to a convening center with a conference center linked with Atlantic Philanthropies and a scholarship space for people to present and debate and discuss. All these scholarship ideas are moving forward at a different pace. 
The undergraduate postgraduate split among students is changing. Many universities now have more than a 50 50 postgraduate undergraduate split, but were built for undergraduate occupation. So places like the Long Room Hub at Trinity College Dublin or this building at the University, Queen's University Belfast. This had a fundamental impact on taught postgraduates because all of a sudden they had a place that was theirs and for them of a quality they thought was appropriate and they were satiated through that process. Eventually, the urban fabric gets changed, the long run, the depressing nature. This had been here at the Wilkin Building at UCL for decades and decades and decades, but no longer. The pressure to resolve it eventually occurred. Buildings that I remember going to at Harvard, which are challenging buildings and possibly miserable buildings, no longer are miserable. This degree of enlivenment and excitement has fundamentally changed the nature of universities. But possibly one of the biggest challenges for high achieving research universities and their relationship to uh, innovation and community is the problem of residential development. The University of Cambridge had a chronic issue of postdoc staff retention because of the housing problems in Cambridge. So the solution was to resolve those housing problems and provide that continuity which allowed them to have continuity of postdoc activity. So this is the Eddington scheme, a very, very extensive scheme, even with its own school of a very high quality in terms of what it does. The University of Cambridge built this itself at its own hand. The University of Oxford is not going to do that, but look at the numbers. Four billion commitments, and as you look at the middle of the paragraph, to develop homes for staff and students and science and innovation districts in and around Oxford. If Oxford aren't to be successful now, where will they be with this 10 year infusion of capital to advance the university? That infusion not only relates to science and innovation, but sometimes the scale of what's being done. This is the um, uh, principal campus of Columbia University, but Columbia University is building a second new campus called Manhattanville. If you take a European 20,000 student university, this project is three times bigger than the whole assets of those universities. To give you an impression of the scale and the weight of progress that some people are making. That's at the high end, at the lower end, we still have a greater interaction. I talked about collections. There's a great interaction of maker spaces and involvement in participating in how things are designed, created, engineered and organized through this part of the process. And the final two points are industrial, industrial embedding of facilities. This is the $240 million 10 year IBM MIT program, which resulted in this building. So you start to see how the relationship between industry and uh, academe is getting much more tighter on campus over the longer term. I could have talked about Jaguar Land Rover University of Warwick. I could have talked about Microsoft University of Cambridge. These things are developing over time. So the concept of enterprise innovation research is becoming embedded on campus, but as relevant to that is scholarship and libraries and all those things. What we therefore find is whilst we, as we look at the future of the university, urban, green, historic, residential will drive it. The diversification into different student groups, staff groups, innovation, research and activity is the rich tapestry that universities will see as you move forward to the future. And thinking there'll be a single narrow typology is naive as everyone operates in three sets of global rankings with movement of staff and students all over the world. So that's a short snapshot in a few minutes of the future trends of universities. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul, for all these pictures and, and impressions. I'm really impressed by the range of historical examples and atmospheres, but also for so many modern well-being and collaborative places. So thanks a lot for, for um, these insights. Now I hand over to our next speaker in pulse number two is Dr. Samantha Hall. Um, Sam, it's your turn. OK, so I'm going to talk about the way that the campus is changing and really bringing in the student perspective. So I'm Principal Director of Campus Intuition. We are a research consultancy um, and we focus on measuring campus experience for staff and students. And our goal by doing that is to create a clearer picture for, for how um, people rate spaces across campuses um, and different university environments to actually help property and estates teams make more informed decisions about their property. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background 
about how we actually measure campus experience to put it into context, because what I'm going to talk about with these trends is, is data that we've collected from students and what students have been telling us about their campuses. Um, so our main mechanism of data collection is called the Campus Experience Index, and this is an online evaluation where staff um, or students rate different elements of their campus. Uh, they'll tell us about, they'll rate their teaching spaces, informal study spaces, libraries, um, sense of safety, sense of belonging. We have about 10 different areas that we assess with different campuses. So they'll score it and then they'll leave us open comments about what they like or don't like about those spaces. So I've just finished a project. We've had 1,200 students come through and we've had nearly 7,000 comments. So it's a lot of data that comes in. And what we do is go through all of that data and put it through a funnel process, all of these comments to understand what delights or annoys students about their campus um, as a first port of call with the space characteristics. So as an example, a student might say, I love the natural environment on campus. And then we look at what influences how they use that space. So if I stay with that example, they might say, well, there's not enough weather protection in the outdoor spaces and the furniture is not very good. So I just don't use those outdoor spaces very much. And then we try and, and do a deeper layer and look at specific locations and places across campus. And they might say, well, the, the outdoor space um, near the library, the west end of the library, the furniture is really uncomfortable. So that's how we go through and get an understanding of, of what students like and don't like. Um, and just as another example here, what you can see here is the blurred out names are lecture theatres from a client. These are all the student comments. I've got negative comments on the left and positive comments on the right. So sometimes we get something like this spike. So you can see that that is a location on campus that students really don't like, and that comes down to furniture for this particular space. They really do not like flip desks or having lectures in areas with no desks. Um, so that gives you a little bit of background about what we do. Um, you know, and our, our whole philosophy sits in the fact that spaces cue actions and nudge behavior, and we're trying to get a really deep insight about how different campus environments nudge behavior. And there's two polar opposites right there. We've got University of Miami um, logo where students can take photos and versus the University of Oxford library. So cues very different behaviors across both of those elements. So that gives you a bit of background and I'll go into some of the trends that we're observing based on what students have told us. Um, the first the thing that I have noticed is that student voice is getting stronger and COVID has really been a catalyst for the student voice for making universities more accountable for what they promise to students. Um, the marketing and promises that are often made to students perhaps on websites and different marketing material doesn't necessarily happen when they're on the ground. So when we get a new client, the first thing I do is jump on social media to actually understand what the campus experience is really like for students. And I've just got a couple of examples that I've plucked randomly off TikTok um, I've got University of Amsterdam, University of Glasgow and University of New South Wales here and these are just students walking around the facilities giving a narrative about the different facilities and what they like and don't like but these get you know this has got 58,000 views this has got 214,000 views and students are asking questions and getting feedback about the campus. Um, there's also lots of university review sites that are popping up. This is one called Student Crowd, but there's a plethora of them where students can leave feedback about their universities. Um, YouTube, this is a, um, a YouTube channel called A Life That Travels in Australia. He walks around different campuses all over Australia, interviews students, looks at all the facilities and gives you a commentary about that university. And then there's websites as well. This is a snapshot from um, Reddit. Reddit and Quora are really popular where students go to talk to others and learn about the, the university before they make a decision. So this is really important going forward. It doesn't mean that rankings are not still playing a role in when students decide what campus they want to go to, but actual campus life and experience has become more important following COVID, especially for undergraduates that have been stuck at home, stuck inside, and they've realised the importance of human connection and actually having the vibrancy and the activated place that Paul talked about. Um, and social media is really where they're going and these university review sites to figure out what is campus life really like. So universities are going to have to become more accountable for what they're actually promising to students. Um, the topic of diversity, inclusion and belonging is going to become even more important. So one of the questions that we ask in our um, campus experience index is what's your sense of belonging to the university? And it is always one of the most fascinating topics to examine. Um, we have an average score of 51%, which was pre-COVID. The scores are coming back lower now post-COVID for that sense of belonging because people haven't had that sense of connection and they haven't met as many friends. Um, so belonging is dropping. 
Um, but the thing that always surprised me is surprises me is how many students say, oh, I don't belong to the community. Um, I don't belong to this university because I'm not a typical student, because I'm a parent, because I'm mature age, because I'm a postgrad, because I'm an international student. Um, I don't really, I don't really fit in. And I've just got some statistics from Australia just to counteract this. So 36% um, of students enrolled in universities in Australia are 25 or over, which is um, considered um, mature age. So we have quite a lot of mature age students and mature age is one of the biggest issues that I see come up in the belonging um, section of our index is that they feel like university is made for young people and not for older people. Um, I'm a postgraduate. You can see here, this is stats from the 90s. We're getting um, growing numbers of, of postgraduate students, particularly as we get more stackable courses and micro credentials coming online. Um, and if I go back to that, how spaces cue action and behavior, if you think about being a postgraduate where you might be working all day and then stepping onto campus in the evening, if the whole campus is closed and your, your course is in one room down the end of a hallway, you can't get a cup of tea, um, there's, there's nobody else around, that, that built environment actually speaks to you and says you don't really belong here. Um, you know, we're just sort of opening up because you're on the periphery. So I think we have to get better at, at making sure that the campus speaks to this huge diversity um, in students that we're seeing. Um, some other feedback we get, I'm, I'm a disabled student, I'm from regional and remote areas. Uh, so this is, we've had a huge drive in Australia to grow equity uh, in our universities and groups of equity students. Um, so this is from 2013 to 2019, the growth in some of these equity cohorts, which is huge. Um, low socioeconomic, disabled students, up to um, almost 40% there, Indigenous, women in non-traditional areas, regional, remote and non-English speaking background. So again, this diversity, the, the melting pot of students is growing. Um, international students, we've had huge growth in Australia. This is since the 90s. Higher education is the purple line on the top here. So you can see we've just had tremendous growth in international students. So I'm seeing, um, oh, sorry, one more there. I forgot we've got more females than males enrolling as well. Um, so I'm seeing lots of student uh, universities talk about personalising the student experience. But what that really comes down to and what is so important is seeing the campus through all of these different users' eyes. Um, and campuses are becoming more diverse than cities now with the different nationalities and, and different backgrounds. Um, and just to put this into context with a bit of a personal story, since working with universities, I've had two young kids and have been breastfeeding babies. And it always surprises me the number of campuses that I step onto that don't have parent facilities, that don't have parenting rooms or childcare for students. So if you're trying to recruit and attract these students, the campus needs to speak to those students as well and provide a, an easy experience for them to actually come to campus and to engage. Um, that accounts for events as well, um, you know, events being held through the day that cater to different needs. So definitely seeing, um, I mean, climate change is obviously everywhere. We're seeing more of a focus on um, retrofitting existing buildings as opposed to new buildings as the pressure for climate change is, is growing. Um, there's new rankings now that are starting to emerge, like the Times Higher Education Impact Ranking, which is measuring universities on their sustainable development goal performance. We have student organisations popping up, which are putting a lot of pressure on universities as well, like Students Organising for Sustainability. It's an international organisation. They've engaged, I think it's about 3 million um, students now. And the UK branch of that is very active and has been lobbying universities to do more on climate change quite successfully. And universities are starting to look at what they're teaching, um, what is being researched and what industry partnerships they're forming that align with climate change. But also importantly, it's, it, it comes down to their own facilities. Um, and you know, there's been so much uh, happening about net, net zero carbon neutrality and reducing operational energy across buildings. But we're seeing more now about embodied energy in buildings and people are becoming more carbon literate. Students are becoming more carbon literate and understanding you know, what embodied energy is and you know, why do we keep building so many new buildings instead of fixing existing spaces, especially at universities when um, utilisation can be quite low. Um, and I've just got a couple of examples here. This is a university that we worked with in the UK, a before and after photo. So we went to the students and they told us about what they wanted on their campus and what was working and not working. And some of that was informal study space, outdoor space, social space. So we just picked a couple of locations around the campus and did these small projects. 
um, you know, from picnic tables in a car park to quite a nice outdoor space. These kind of projects focusing on the existing estate are not going to win the front page of an architectural magazine or an award, um, but they are high impact projects that uh, low environmental footprint as well and are going to actually transform the student experience. And this is where we need to get more targeted and focused with campus activation and creating really clever centres of density to create that vibrancy. Um, this is another one just out the front of a library. Um, so you can see it's really simple. It's just some, a variety of furniture out the front of the library to try and make it a little bit more vibrant. Uh, so another, we, we get a lot of feedback from students about nature. Um, integration with nature and places for them to actually switch off. So we run an experience mapping exercise with universities where we get students to send us photos and commentary about their campus. And it is always dominated by pictures of nature. Um, wherever they are, even if they're on a campus with not a lot of nature, they always manage to send me a picture of a tree. And I think what's really important here is that we have to preserve some of this green space to actually nudge students to switch off because in a digital world, they are on all the time. And so I'm seeing more spaces pop up, outdoor study spaces, which I think are great, but we also need to preserve some of this green space to really allow people to relax and switch off and unwind and engage with nature. And there is so much research about the benefits of nature to productivity and well-being, and being able to have a break and then reset and go back and work. It's much better for your productivity. Um, and I get all kinds of pictures, you know, this is from the UK, very cold, but a glimpse out the window and she was telling me how much she loved this view and how relaxed it made her feel. Vines um, on a cement building, so they always manage to find pictures in nature. Seeing an increased emphasis on um, co-working spaces, but I would caution this as well, as Paul said, Libraries are the heart. Libraries are always the most popular area that students tell us that they love studying. And when you think about when you walk into a library, it does cue you to behave in a certain way. It's quiet, it's calm, it's creative. It typically has high ceilings, which is linked to, to creativity. So it helps students to behave in a certain way, but we are seeing lots of informal study spaces um, popping up, higher quality study spaces. Um, and these are a few from University of Melbourne and Crabfield University in the UK. Um, so what you can see in these photos is most of the time students are still working on their own, but they're alone together. They've got people around them. Really successful informal study spaces are away from high traffic areas. They've got kitchen nearby where students can go and make a cup of tea and have a break. Um, but they're, you know, they provide some of that structure and motivation. And that's what I've seen from students who were home during COVID. They missed the structure that the university provides. When they step onto that campus, they're, they're there for a reason. They can study at home. They have to self-motivate and that becomes a lot, a lot more difficult. Students are still craving quiet space to study. And I think we can um, are potentially starting to flip too much into creating vibrant co-working spaces that drive collaboration amongst students. Um, we need to still remember that people need a quiet space to work. And so I think we're going to see um, more investment in really high quality library spaces that might provide that quiet space and more of these informal co-working spaces that might be a bit louder. Um, but these are still a great way to attract students onto the campus. And alluding to what Paul said as well, when these are student lounges that are dedicated to cohorts, they're really well attended as well. So we might have a business postgrad area that students can come and work. That helps them form that community and that sense of belonging. Um, cafes, uh, I mean, this is from University of Western Australia, so cafes as co-working spaces are really popular. Um, students want to just have a break, come in, have a cup of tea, go for a walk, um, get away from whatever they've been doing. Um, they won't necessarily have a long dwell time in these. They won't stay there for a long time, but it's good to have a break. And we're seeing desire for higher quality spaces as well. So they don't just want cheap cafeteria kiosk, but there's some variety in these spaces. And these are always so popular. So I'm going to go from the macro down into the micro and just give a little bit of feedback about teaching spaces and how we're seeing that transform as well. Um, students always tell us about the spaces that are easier for them to learn in. Um, and these are just two examples of typical types of spaces that we see. The one on the left is hard to work in, the one on the right is easy to work in. They love spaciousness, they love being able to move the furniture around easily, a space that matches the pedagogy. So if the tutor is walking around engaging with them um, and they can turn and watch and engage with that lecture as well, but you can see on the left, that's a lot more difficult for someone to be able to move around that room. 
um, lots of screens, lots of whiteboards, and that space on the right is also really flexible. So we talk about flexible spaces a lot. They're quite hard to do, but you can look at that picture and you can see you know, three or four different ways that that room can be used. Um, and that becomes really important going forward as we are not building as many buildings and we have to use current space more efficiently is really being creative with how flexible spaces can, can be. And daylight is a big one as well. So daylight and ventilation is something that students pick up on a lot. They really don't like spaces that don't have enough daylight. Um, makes them sleepy and though I've had students tell me they just won't go to a class if, if, a, if a space looks really drab um, and doesn't have much daylight. Um, there is the online challenge that we're grappling with. Um, this is a quote from a student. I was thinking of doing my online shoots in one of the libraries or just any study space inside, but I'm a bit worried that me talking might disturb others. Sitting outside would be nice, but I probably will get distracted easily. So this is difficult. Space is going to have to change um, differently for universities that are still doing a lot of classes online. Students will still want to come to campus to get that motivation and that structure that I talked about earlier. They don't necessarily want to be doing their online lecture at home um, or their, their tute that is interactive. So space has to be able to um, accommodate that as well. Um, and I, the recent work I've, I've just done, I've had so many students tell me they're worried about disturbing other people. Um, and there's a high demand for private rooms and study rooms, which again is where you can utilize the rest of the campus more effectively. So I think we're gonna see growth in technology, in space utilization and space planning technology that allows people to use spaces that they usually wouldn't access so that we can overcome these kind of challenges. Um, Paul alluded to student accommodation growth as well. Um, it's been interesting working in different countries and seeing it, you know, Australian universities are really commuter based. We don't do a lot of student accommodation. Students tend to go to a university that is close to their home rather than actually leaving and moving into student accommodation. But in the feedback I get from students, they love being in student accommodation. They've got a ready-made community. Um, it's a lot less intimidating. They don't face the challenges like parking and commute, which has come up a lot since COVID. It's similar to um, people who are working in a CBD. Um, they don't want to have that commute time um, anymore. So I think we're going to see really big growth in student accommodation, um, definitely in Australia and other areas where that have been low on student accommodation. I think it's going to be a real differentiator for, for universities as we come out of COVID. Um, and then the one I'm going to end on, um, which is a very tricky one, a lot of changes to staff workplace. So dare I mention open plan, um, but academic and professional staff at universities are starting to demand, to demand much more flexibility since COVID as are most industries. What does that mean for the university? We've got so many private offices across many universities still. Um, and I don't think there's a really clear model of what a good academic workspace looks like that is efficient with space use, but also comfortable for the for, for the academic. Academics in particular, professional staff are able to um, fit their work into open plan and more agile spaces. But for academics, it requires a different approach. Um, shared offices, for instance, smaller offices, but I'm yet to see some really strong models come out um, that are hitting that utilization and comfort for the users. So I think this is going to be a really transformational area in the next few years. Um, and I think that's about it. That's my LinkedIn if you want to connect with me or my, or my um, email. Thanks a lot, Sam, for this insights of your work. And when I look back to my student time in architectural, um, I had three big points I remember. Um, there were big collaboration spaces and this was really cool be, because we were discussing co-working and building models seven days a week so we spent much time in collaboration collaboration spaces we had a good mensa and small coffee coffee shops and so on it, it was also really important and also the outdoor places and a huge green park that was really cool because we spent all the summertime in the park and lay there and and discuss and so so this the spaces and collaboration spaces uh, spaces inspiring spaces i think mm. this is really important yeah it's obviously made your experience very memorable and you look back at that nostalgically so i think it's really important that we embrace that and still continue with the you know a focus on high quality space yeah.
Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sam. Then I hand over to David Keenan. Um, thank you, Alex and Waldner, for the invitation and the opportunity to present. Um, <laughs> they've set a high standard, Paul and Samantha, so hopefully I can uh, follow and do, and do, uh, do some credit for my, my own part. I'm going to touch a little bit on um, innovation districts and then circle back to some examples, so hopefully you'll find this of interest. So uh, as everyone is aware, um, we've been going through some very tough times with regards to COVID and the impact both felt and ongoing, not least with the current unknowns of the Omicron variant. Perhaps of most relevance to the non-Australian audience, the attach shows how the Australia um, has been traveling with the outbreak, the initial arrival, a bit of a return, and then most recently the Delta um, outbreak. For Australia and our higher education sector, COVID has had a huge impact in terms of revenue, given the significant number of overseas students our universities served prior prior to COVID. And of course, we lost um, a lot of that when the borders closed. I should also note in terms of keeping content fresh and up to date, um, it's just just this week, the proposed reopening of Australia to some international students has already been been pushed back a couple of weeks again, in response to Omicron, which um, is, which is unfortunately now here in Australia. So again, the tartan, as soon as you think the lights at the end of the tunnel, um, it drags you back in. Um, uh, not to labour the point, but I just thought this was interesting from a from a this is a global webinar, so I thought this could be of interest just to sort of show some of the context of how um, cases are trending through APAC, US, and EMEA, and obviously within APAC, we're, we're not doing too badly in the in the scheme of things. Um, so when COVID hit, um, it's fair to say Aust um, in Australia, the mass migration to online teaching from in person or on campus was incredibly fast. While the move online um, had been a growing trend, it's fair to say the catalyst of COVID certainly was a massive push to move everything that could go online to go online ASAP. And as you can see from the the, the figure, three quarters of the actions um, were that was, was that instant and mass move to online learning. In talking to many educators, they do note in hindsight both how quickly they were able to make the move to online, but also how the technology was just at that at sweet um, and right point to facilitate the transition via Zoom or Teams, exactly as we're doing now. However, um, now that the move to online has occurred and the reopening of campuses and hopefully international student travel is, is, is back, if not um, on the radar, there is an opportunity to reflect um, on the appetite of campus learning versus online. As noted on the attached and on, on, on data we've looked at, the majority of students still do want a physical campus and real person-to-person -person experience as part of their education. Again, Sam and Paul talked, talked at length on that. It, it's, it's a true driver. This is obviously great from those of us interested in facilities and opportunities campuses can provide for students and educators alike. Um, so thankfully, campuses aren't yet dead. <laughs> So with relative closure of campuses and the international travel restrictions, there's obviously been a significant impact on revenue. This isn't new news, but certainly at the core of many challenges that we're that we're seeing and, and that are being faced right now by institutions globally. As shown here, the exponential curve in gold. In general terms, the higher education sector, um, again here in Australia, is reliant on international students had been significant. And with the closure of our borders, it was estimated that would equate to give or take $16 billion loss uh, by 2023 directly um, felt by the universities. And as again, as we've touched on, um, students also spend in the community. So there's the, also the additional economic loss to, um, at large to factor in on top of the direct losses the universities felt. So again, this presentation has a particularly Australian focus um, and def certainly not like my accent. And here we've had um, in, in Australia, we've had the federal government intervene with some levers at its disposal to mix up the sector and to drive more students to STEM in, in particular or a, a preposition to target STEM. This is obviously a multifaceted move by government and the impact is still being assessed by the sector. Again, noting the impact of extended border controls on international students, but also in response to changing priorities on the future workforce and identification and filling of those um, potential future gaps. In considering this as a, with a glass half full approach um, and the positives in terms of driving student number and in turn investment towards science, technology, engineering and math subjects, this is a solid move um, locally in Australia to build on the outstanding foundations we have. 
So in pushing those students towards STEM, it's reasonable to see the knock-on benefits to Australia's strategic priorities. Another aspect of COVID was, of course, the sudden realisation to many countries on how dependent they are on each other. The sovereign risk of securing stocks of PPE, essential equipment such as ventilators and now vaccines was and remains a very real issue for many countries um, that had to work through. Again, in looking at the positives um, and the learnings from COVID, this really put a focus on key requirements um, that, that will fuel education and, and in turn job creation in these sectors and the expertise that comes along with, with, with specialties in engineering, security, technology, environment, food and health. And of course, the higher education is, is crucial in addressing all of these. So here we've got a bit of a curve that I'm, I'm just a, an absolute fan of because I, seem, I think the simplicity, um, it, it's a great reference to where the opportunities are and where we're going. In a globally competitive market, it's important to identify and as required shift towards those areas where, in this instance, Australia again can compete and obtain the maximum benefit. In shifting our, in shifting our focus to either end of the value curve, the target is and, and certainly believe it's achievable to exploit local R&D and technical abilities and expertise and move away from the minimal value add um, as part of a, 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 the, the production line, a larger production process. Australia does have fantastic strengths in education, research, discovery and also as, as an advanced economy is well positioned for the latter half in terms of sales, marketing and, trans and administration. So again, in terms of the campus transformation, it's it's the crudest way of looking at it is, is potentially to follow the money and follow the opportunities. So in terms of some case studies and circling back to the campus focus, um, if 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 the alignment um, is coming uh, with with, what the, with the government's focus, we also have leading industries and we also have fantastic universities and higher education providers. So. The question has to be asked, how hard can it be to make the magic happen of innovation and 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 um, uh, and, and blossoming ecosystems? But it, again, the crux and the answer of that is it's not as simple as a build it and they will come solution. As noted in the quote above and, and the, on the next slide, the evolution of the definitions does articulate the nuances um, as we as we learn lessons and seek to continually improve. So this this quote on your screen from 2014, is the is the sort of the before so hopefully everyone's had a quick look at that and then we go to the give or take the more current definition and really talking to those innovation precincts um, and again taking the time to develop and and the need to be situated within that r d intensive ecosystem which relies on many things um, not least open competitive re regulatory environments and good government again th things that paul touched on beautifully with some some fantastic benchmark uh, uh, campuses um, globally um, again a slide that, that many australian based listeners would be familiar with I mean, it's a, but it's a very simple image um, and, and really articulates a very logical evolutionary pathway of building um, in this instance the innovation district but again hopefully you can see the parallels with the campus model these challenges do take time have multiple factors to consider but most importantly the, are those fundamental building blocks the, that initial cluster um, uh, from which to build from um, in uh, whether it's the hospital the uni both it, uh, you need those raw ingredients um, from which to build on. And then to pick on some of those characteristics listed here of successful innovation precincts, that would be market drive. One, one again, I've, I've highlighted a one per category, but the market drivers and having strong market demand for the goods or the services, again, that alignment back to government priorities, um, that puts that competitive pressure in the sector to innovate and access to markets. It's always good when you have a competitive advantage, clearly. Um, uh, that defined advantage that is communicated through strong branding to attract and retain talented staff and students. Um, again, we're in we're in a it's a competitive market out there. We need to support that by pro productivity um, settings. Collaboration is, is crucial, facilities and programs to support collaborations between diverse organizations. And then things that get of particular interest to me in terms of the infrastructure, the physical transport and digital infrastructure that supports education, research, innovation activity and business connectivity, um, both within and external to the precinct. Importantly, again, amenity. We need these places to be vibrant, livable uh, locations that attract people to work, play, live, learn. 
So they're not glib terms, they're hard to do, but they are required for, for true success. Um, and then to conclude on the enterprise culture, strong entrepreneurial culture of risk taking collaboration and sharing and ideas. And then, of course, leadership, robust governance and strong leadership is, cr is crucial and a shared vision. So in terms of some current work um, and an example of an emerging um, innovation district um, is shown here. This is Westmead in Sydney and per the earlier slide on clustering, this district is firmly anchored with several major hospitals in the yellow core to the heart um, uh, and with university partners in the sort of tealy blue colour um, uh, flanking and other dedicated research infrastructure, several medical research institutes. And then we had the exciting um, transition spaces, the, the pinks, where that um, where, where private and public innovation can interface uh, and, and again more of the magic can happen. This Westmead area is currently undergoing a major upgrade with regards to the mass transit infrastructure and once various enabling moves are worked through the potential for this campus in particular is quite extraordinary. So then again in terms of some case studies how do we extract more value out of our existing buildings? In this particular case study, I wanted to talk about the fact that campuses and development can't always be about new builds. With increasing pressure on student revenue and prolonged closures, um, we are seeing universities work sm more smartly with existing buildings and extracting that greater functionality out of them in more and more creative ways. So the, a project again that's that's live um, is a is is a building called C5C. This donut shaped building here in plan at Macquarie University and with this particular building we're, we're creating a new home for the Faculty of Law. Now Macquarie University um, is, is to the north of Sydney. Um, it's on a large expansive green campus with recently completed mass transit connections into Sydney and, and of course the surrounding suburbs. The um, the current C5C building is a three storey uh, building which you can see a couple of the images here with a courtyard to the middle. Um, but it's quite bluntly at the end of its useful life as a teaching space for today's needs. Um, plus, with the, with the growing faculty of law, it's 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 the target for some redevelopment work that we're working through. And what makes this project so exciting is the combination of this beautiful campus. So just an image of Wally's Walk, a really green central spine through the campus. Um, and we also have a client in, in the university that's um, really focused on design excellence and sustainability in, in its capital works um, projects. So again, a couple of the recent projects here um, have, are increasingly larger timber based projects, um, but also um, this, this um, central courtyard project and providing those amazing amenity spaces to, again, to even, even that you just touched on Alex, that, that idea that you want to find somewhere green to go and sit down and read or have a sandwich. So that there's some really fantastic work going on um, um, here at Macquarie. Unfortunately, some, a lot of the images are still under embargo. So this is the one teaser and hopefully there's a future presentation where I can, we can focus on this actual building project. But in, in, if, in short, we're demolishing most of the building and retaining the ground slab, putting through a timber structure um, through the building and mass timber uh, structure, uh, putting a roof over the, over the top and enclosing what is currently that external courtyard and, and creating a functional internal atrium space, all with the, all with current contemporary teaching spaces that have that flexibility that um, Samantha touched on. Another project um, I wanted to touch on um, is the Lees building at the University of Sydney. So this is the Life, Earth and Environmental Sciences building um, completed in 2018. Um, and it's at one of the two um, main access points. Um, this is City Road, it's a main road in and out of Sydney. Um, and really the project um, was a really great place and opportunity as a, as a, as a gatepost, as a, as a bookmark on the campus. Um, but what I wanted to focus on here is the inclusion that it's it's really about maximizing the opportunity on campus of a highly constrained site um, and um, with this project um, emerging design of the super lab for teaching wet lab um, environments to, to uh, large student cohort numbers so firstly 
with regards to the constrained site, you'll note the building's generally triangular in nature. Um, and that really is just driven, it's wedged between an existing building in grey, you'll see to the top, um, and then these beautiful big heritage trees um, to the bottom, which flank the road. So the site was set and, and quite quite limited in terms of the, that triangular footprint. Um, but it does provide for several super labs, which again, I think is a fantastic design outcome. And this top left image um, highlights highlights it. And this is just an interesting pedagogy style where in that open space with technology, um, last, a large number of different uh, wet lab classes can be taught simultaneously. And that idea of squeezing the efficiency out of building stock is, um, is a fantastic takeaway. Um, another tool that universities um, and Samantha touched on it was that utilisation piece again and that idea before universities press the button on a new capital works project, drilling down and trying to squeeze out that if understanding when this space is in use, can they use them small, more smartly? So again, I'm just including that here and HDR as the architect of the, of the Lees building are doing some fantastic work in the uh, data driven design space. Um, another quick example um, at the University of Melbourne is um, where they have a, a main campus in Parkville and to the north of the CBD in Melbourne. Um, and per the quote, um, this project is focused on providing um, an amazing world class campus um, student experience. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll try and speed up. Um, the area in red um, highlights the specific part of the campus um, that was nominated to form the student precinct and the existing buildings that would be reworked to provide the desired amenity. So again, a, a real focus on adaptive reuse. I think this project again is a great example of a university putting students at the very centre of their thinking, which as touched on earlier is a great idea when it comes to providing the very best experience for students in a very, very competitive environment. The concept images I'm showing here and on the previous slides also focus on a, a fantastic initiative where the university was really focused on providing highly collaborative environments for the design teams and to allow smaller and emerging practices the opportunity to work on, on much larger projects that they wouldn't normally be able to or equipped to. And I'm very close to wrapping up just to circle back onto the vertical campus um, examples that were touched on again, I think um, earlier on. It's important that I think we don't only think expansively on the ground plane, but also vertically. So here there's four examples, two of them complete and two under construction of the vertical campus um, environment, which for obvious reasons um, is particularly relevant for CBD and developments where the only viable expansion area is up. Um, I've taken the liberty to include a high school here as well. Um, this bottom right example, um, again in Australia, we've 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 really got a a bit of a focus at the moment on vertical campus environments, just to cater for growing student numbers in those urban environments. And we're also witnessing a push for many universities to move to the student populations, which I believe, um, again, you'll see here with these Western Sydney Uni examples are are, are, are leading the leading a bit of a charge on. So it goes without saying that the vertical campus does pose its own challenges to that of a traditional sprawling campus, not least with moving staff and students up and down. But again, these are all topics that we could focus a deeper dive on um, at a later date. So my last slide. What might the future campus look like? Um, international students, we will need to see what the future holds as borders reopen. And that's probably the biggest unknown right now. But I should also just threw in here, and um, as, as you were speaking, Samantha, there's an article just being published in the Sydney Morning Herald about the high flex model that's just about to be launched at University of Sydney. And, and it's just to uh, suggest everyone have a look at that. That's an interesting story. Um, the universities, of course, will remain um, as essential um, to, and they need to continue to produce the best and brightest minds and discoveries um, and the importance will continue to be on the focus of the student experience and providing the very best environments in a market that will always be highly or should should be highly competitive and of course collaboration will continue to be key um, for unlocking the potential of a campus so thank you thank you david and thanks again for for all these insights and statistics and and, and pictures so now we come we come to the Q&A session. If you have questions, write it in the chat. If you have a certain question to a certain person, write, for example, Paul, double point and, and the question. So I would say we start. Here is a question in, in the chat. Um, I think that would match perfectly to you, David. Um, the, the question is, you noted 
the opportunities for universities to recycle existing buildings. Do you see that as a knee-jerk response to COVID or longer-term strategy? Um, I actually do think it's a it's a longer term strategy. I think the like uh, the move to online COVID has been a catalyst to accelerate some of these moves, but I do believe the recycling and repurposing was always coming. It's just perhaps come a little bit sooner and perhaps a little bit more focused, but um, I think it's a very smart move uh, for campuses and again as they need to spend their, their limited funds uh, more carefully. Um, yeah. Okay, here's a question and uh, Samantha, perhaps something for you. It's about what will differentiate campuses into the future and how can they stand out from competitors? Um, I think we, I mean, obviously we've, we've talked about campus experience being a key differentiator and I think this becomes more important as um, learning goes online. Um, you know, this project that I've just done, I had students quite angry that they were still learning online and they said, if I'd known everything was going to be online, I could have chosen any university from around the world. I came to this university because of X, Y and Z. Um, and I think it's about being, universities can become a bit more introspective and move away from, from the trends um, and figure out what makes their university really stand out. Is it the natural environment? Is it being in an urban location? Is it being in a great city? Um, and really sell themselves around that, make that part of the brand. I think that is what is going to make them stand out. Okay, thank you. And here's a question, uh, Paul. I think that would match to you. In an ever more digital and connected world, will the campus survive in the long run? What do you mean? Well, I think the more digital the world becomes, the more important campus becomes. It's like anything. If you want to, we can all shop online if you want to go to a retail mall it's got to be worth going to so what the digital world is going to do is make campus more important otherwise it will fail there are certain things that have happened for a very long time whether it's playing sports whether it's debating undertaking drama watching music connecting with your friends doing all those things which you really can't do online and and sam could talk to you about the, uh, a piece of work called the sense of belonging about why people feel they belong to a university so the whole basis of going to a university is about being on campus in the long run. There will always be people who can learn online and the people who will choose to learn online and may or can only afford to learn online. But the premier university experience in the long run will be a campus that's worthy of going there in relation to the alternative. So I think it will remain the um, standout aspect. OK, thanks. And here's another question. I think that would also be something for you, Paul. Um, will campuses be more or less residential over the period? And given the dynamism in the world, how can you create strategy as opposed to letting things unfold and following trends? Okay, well, if, if as I said out of my, my uh, debate earlier on, the urban university will become the most efficient, most successful university in the long run. The corollary to that is that you are focusing on areas which become much more expensive for students to live. Um, and if you're trying to have a, a university model, which is expensive for students to live, then providing that accommodation by the university as we're starting to see, whether it's in the Stanford Housing Scheme in Palo Alto or the Cambridge Scheme in um, the UK, uh, there will need to be more residential development produced by by universities themselves. And in some parts of the world, it's very high. In some parts of the world, it's very low. So that's likely to be um, the occurrence over that time. The second point, the point you asked me about the um, how you how things unfold over the long run. Many things never change, never change. The desire to eat together, talk together, perform together, play sport together, walk. There's never been an unfashionable tree. Unfashionable buildings, yes, and not an unfashionable tree. <laughs> Technology changes, but we always operate at a human scale. So if you focus on campus being an opera, a human environment at human scale, nature, as Sam's mentioned, never changes in that respect. And you focus on all the issues and don't get bogged down with technology. As I showed you, Chicago Circle in the 1960s was probably seen as the future. It was actually a regressive step. So as long as you stay at human scale, you connect with nature and you allow people to do what they wish to do in flexible buildings, you will always be okay. Otherwise, you're always waiting 
for the technological silver bullet that when it comes will be a mistake. Paul, thanks. Here's another question. I think, Sam, something for you. Are universities doing enough for climate change? What are the biggest opportunities? Um, I don't think anyone's really doing enough for climate change. We, we think of the recent COP26 outcomes. Um, you know, I think what I talked about, the focus on operational energy and embodied energy becoming um, more of a focus now is great. I think there is a huge opportunity for universities to communicate better with students about what they are doing for sustainability and climate change. And that helps create a sense of place identity. So even the tables we used in one of our projects were focused on um, circularity. So these tables can be easily deconstructed at the end of use and recycled. That that gives the students that like, they're so proud of their university for, do, for doing something like that. So I think just more storytelling about sustainability beyond we, we're doing a lead building or a, a brand building or a green star building. Um, and that will help really engage students as well. Thanks a lot, Sam. There's a question for you, David. The question is, what do you think universities will do to balance the potential reduced incomes for those that rely on international travel? but also remain relevant and attractive to both students and academics? That's the million dollar question. I think the, 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 on, the push to online and the balancing of, of supply and demand in that regard is, is obviously happening and, and has worked to a degree. I think the, I think again, I think what we're seeing is a real push to bring in private sector finance in many instances um, for a lot of projects where in the past universities probably would have preferred to go alone and do and deliver their capital works projects um, as they are. I think there's a there's a more of a willingness to to partner up. Um, so I think there's a there's a bit of a variety of options in terms of the PPP, in terms of developer partnerships. Um, the universities often have the land, um, which is which is the ultimate asset. Um, so that appetite to, to partner um, um, and and share the risk, I think, is 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 it's it's brought left forward um, during the during the recent um, COVID um, crunch. Thank you. Here's another question in the chat for you, Paul. Um, what do you think it is the major problem for the research universities will be that are located within an urban area? Well, research universities that have very difficult uh, research platform requirements, I do understand the, I understand the challenge of uh, medical or engineering or all those facilities and uh, sometimes the resolution of that I mean when I talked earlier on about the Oxford model a very urban environment uh, Oxford have moved quite a lot of activities out of the center of Oxford so things like wind tunnels um, uh, accelerators those sorts of things end up getting moved out non-teaching research so as long as you keep as long as you keep the teaching research in the central area, sometimes you have to accept that certain facilities move. That's referred to as the academic trade, whereby a researcher acknowledges that a particular research platform is unrealistic to build it in Manhattan. And therefore, as long as the facility is good enough, they're happy to travel to a more remote location to get access to an exceptional piece of research infrastructure. But it's got to be reasonably accessible and when you get there, the experience has to be um, good, but don't move students there. So I think that that is a challenge that a lot of European universities are struggling with at the moment, which is very difficult, but it's a, it's a that's a tough question. Paul, can I can I jump in on that, Alex? Um, and, and Paul, without without warning, <laughs> is that um, is it is that do you see that um, parallel occurring at the University of Melbourne with Fisherman's Bend in terms of that opportunity for uh, again, not sure how familiar you are with it, but in terms of the engineering, the op a rare opportunity to have an, a new campus, as it were, in a city environment that that they can have pioneering R&D facilities and what have you. I, I'm just intrigued to sort of pull on that thread a little bit more because um, I do think the Uni of Melbourne example is quite interesting. Yeah, I think Fisherman's Bend is symptomatic of the the point I was, you know, I was making. Um, there are four large research platforms at Fisherman's Bend, which are not um, subject focused, participant in both, so that's where they're, you know, they're wind tunnel, water, energy in that respect. 
and they're also allowing them to do architectural work which can't be done necessarily in a in a in a smaller more compact studio so i think that that approach is a uh, is a understandable approach of those sorts of things that will happen if we take that parallel back to london um you know the bartlett school of, of architecture right in the center of london near king's cross was unable to have the experimental spaces they wanted and they moved to the old broadcast center at what was the olympic park so there's similar parallels where a choice is made that the quality of the remote facilities for research is sufficiently good that it's worthy of moving it away from if you come back to you know von humboldt and cardinal newman and the community of scholars you only break the community of scholars because you have an infrastructure requirement you can't otherwise resolve so uh, i think that's uh, that's a good example of the university of melbourne okay i have also a question to you paul um in your ranking we saw the historical university stanford Hall, uh, harvard uh, cambridge at the top um what do you think why is it this way because of the reputation the high level student network or really the knowledge transfer and the results you mean in terms of the international rankings yes um well international rankings is a one very very complex um complex subject to understand and i you know i deal with universities that move around in the rankings and they don't understand understand um why they move around in the rankings but fundamentally fundamentally you know there are unusual things about uh, I'll, i'll give you a couple of examples therefore i mean one of the fundamental issues about um uh universities is a sort of number of PhD students. So if a, a university has say 12, 13, 14% of PhD students, very high not percentage, they will do materially better. And therefore, should you ensure that you provide facilities that are appropriate to that group? The other issue, which is problematic, which is where you've got um, a university that are trying to use student fees to grow income, you know, marginal income or marginal cost, to drive more income, to spend on research, on the one hand improve their research ranking and while they do that they undermine their staff student ratio and they drop down in that area those are two examples that show how complex it is what my experience is from oxford who i worked with for nearly 15 years is they focus on everything and do everything a bit better everything and that's why they're very good so. okay thanks a lot it was not so easy this question <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I have a question uh, to you, Sam. Um, in our last Academy event, we um, we spoke about incubators and accelerators. Um, what do you think um, about the importance um, to push great student ideas within the campus? Um, I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, you know, I went through a student accelerator. I went through a st the startup pipeline at my university, and that's how I ended up with a business. Um, and I remember thinking whilst doing it, I wish I'd had this training um, at the beginning of my PhD because it made me think completely differently about problems. Um, and I see from students, they have a desire to know what, you know, what's going on on campus. What are students coming up with? What are the ideas? Can we can we sell products that are being developed? So I think there's huge potential for that. Um, some countries commercialize better than others. We don't do it particularly well in Australia. We have poor commercialization record um, compared to the US, for instance. So we have a big focus um, in Australia on trying to get to get better with that commercialization. Thanks a lot for the answer. So at the moment, we have no further questions in the chat. Do you have some questions um, to yourself, David, uh, Paul or, or Sam? No, okay. everything good? Fine. So I would say thanks a lot for all these presentations and insights. It was really interesting. And um, I would say thanks a lot. The next Walton Academy event is in January. We talk about global STEM labs after that innovation center and Roche Pirette Center. So there are really exciting uh, events in the next year. Um, if you are interested in, go on our website and, and register. Thanks a lot for joining us and see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>